Tatum at Casey Family Programs. And uh, what I'm gonna do is mostly, I'm gonna just give you very brief background and then I'm mostly just going to uh, allow our pre presenters to talk and I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. Uh, so uh, Holly Echohawk to my left and Andrea Smith to her left uh, are gonna be the main presenters. And so what I wanna do is just kind of lay the, the groundwork as to why this is um, significant under Family First. It's significant for a lot of other reasons, but under Family First. So um, we don't, do we have a clicker or anything? I guess not, we just have to do it on the computer. Okay, all right, so <clears throat> this is the text of the Family First statute, right? So the secretary has to develop specific requirements for tribes operating the program and the requirements shall to the greatest extent practicable be consistent with the requirements applicable to states and shall permit the provision of services and programs that are adapted to the culture and context of the tribal community served. Right? So that's a, a mandate from Congress about adapting to the culture and context of the community. So we really don't know exactly what that means. Um, it's going to be up to the Children's Bureau ultimately to decide what that means, what the language means, uh, how this will be documented, how it will be evaluated, what programs are going to fit under this. Do they have to be evidence-based programs first and then they have to be tweaked for culture? Can there be another process for approving culturally-based programs that doesn't quite follow the evidence-based model totally? Um, how broad is this provision? So the provision is located in a section of the law that deals with direct funded tribes. But there's also a legislative history about making this available to tribes and, and making sure that tribes have at, are able to do culturally adapted programs. So could this be interpreted more broadly and or somehow through tribal state agreements would this still be something that could be worked into that? Um, um, strategies for developing approved programs regardless of what the definition is. What are the strat going to be possible strategies for getting approved programs, whether they're evidence-based, whether they're cultural adap adapted programs, um, whatever they are, it, how are we gonna get programs that tribes know work, that tribes wanna run, that are gonna be funded through Family First? Right. And then the last thing I'm gonna mention, and I'm gonna get out of the way, because uh, these are the folks who are gonna give you, uh, hopefully, some good uh, information that you can use. Um, there is a federal register notice asking for comments on develop, development of the clearinghouse on evidence-based practices. Those comments are due July 22nd, right? So that's right around the corner. And basically, in order to implement the law, ACF is going to be maintaining a clearinghouse of practices. And, and in their notice, they talk about culturally specific or location or population-based adaptations of practices as being included in what this clearinghouse is going to look at. So it seems to be that they're looking at that cultural adaptation language and planning somehow to use this clearinghouse um, as part of determining that. So again, so these comments are gonna be really important. Um, and there's two things in, these, in, in this notice. One is a set of very detailed criteria that they are initially proposing as the criteria for this. I will admit I read it, it's very dense, very hard to follow. Um, and so I think I would, I would say that, um, and I think Barbara said this in, in a session I was just part of, um, you don't have to comment on every part of the notice, right? Some of it you just say, I don't know what they want there, I don't know what that's about. You can comment on just what you care about. And if the only part you care about is the culturally uh, the cultural adaptations, then just comment on that, okay? So don't let it become overwhelming, um, the fact that the notice is, is extremely complicated. Submit the comments on what's important to you, all right? And then there'll also be a list of approved um, programs and services uh, that there, that's going to come out of this too, all right? So, um, so again, um, that's the overview of why we're having this breakout. That's the overview of why um, although obviously culturally based programs are important for a whole lot of reasons, why we're talking about that in the context of Family First. All right, so with that, I'm gonna turn this over to um, Holly, right? You're going first, Holly Echo Hawk, 
Yes. Question from that. I, I, what's your name again? <laughs> yeah, Anita. Am I? <laughs> um, I'm going to answer it this way. Um, one of the things we're asking Holly to do, in addition to make this presentation today, is she's going to put together by the end of the week more information that would be relevant to comments, to commenting on the, these regulations. Um, you know, we may do something sort of with that to, so that, you know, there's a little context to how you might use her information, but until we see her information, I'm not sure what we're gonna send out with it. It might be perfect as is, and we'll just send it out, or we may be a little bit of, there may be a little bit of extra stuff we send with it. So, so the answer is yes, we'll, we'll provide something on this. Um, okay, so, yes, I will get your PowerPoint up. Hi everybody, uh, I'm Holly Echohawk, and yes, uh, Casey has asked me to put together um, uh, a draft response. I told him I would do it by Friday because it's really important. Uh, I'm a Pawnee Indian from Oklahoma. I've worked in behavioral health for a long time. I've been a former behavioral health director twice, once for the Lummi Nation, a 90 staff group, which is amazing. My Canadian friend said, it, we don't have 90 people in Canada and one tribe has 90. And then also for mainstream uh, children's mental health in Washington State actually for. But we worked on evidence-based practices and making sure tribes have a voice in that whole work for 20 years. So that's why I'm happy to do this really quickly uh, for Casey hopefully uh, by Friday. But uh, cultural adaptations, <coughs> so if you would just advance those for me, it'd be great. So the whole thing about what's the deal about evidence-based practices. Originally, it had a really good intent, because the original intent was practice improvement. Um, and it was all about, uh, in the science world, if there was a way that science could tell us what works and what doesn't work, well, we want to know that. Uh, and the reason I'm holding my phone is not because I'm expecting a message. This is the only clock I have. <coughs> um, so that's it had a good intent. It's gone a little amuck. Um, it's supposed to be proof. You know, how do we know what really works? How do we know what we do is going to last? We all know people have been in treatment for different reasons and kind of short term, and that doesn't really last, doesn't change their life forever. So that's a that's the whole intent, but research is not perfect. Policymakers love it because they can say, oh, solutions um, and money say, which money is the driving factor in all of this. It, you know the chart that they show this morning of number of kids in out-of-home care? All of that, if you took every child and figured out how much it costs a tribe or the state, cost of care, huge. Uh, so it's sadly, it's driven by cost. We're not so much concerned about cost, we're concerned about quality of life. Okay. So who, de who defines, who determines what evidence is? This has been our, our good fight with our good friends in the science world for 20 years. Right now, science and math own that ship. But we, as tribal advocates, are saying, oh no, because if you are so um, perfect in your thinking, then why haven't the numbers changed? Why have those numbers that we saw this morning go up or stay the same over decades? And she said any 10 years swath of time, it's the same. So that tells us science isn't always correct. One of the reasons why is culture is not a factor in most of science research. So you can take a really wonderful practice, and there are many, many wonderful evidence-based practices, so I'm not anti-evidence-based practice. But there's no cultural context. Can you do the next slide, please? Um, I'm gonna tell you about that in a minute, but um, there's a slide that says um, the helicopter approach doesn't work. It doesn't work in research, it doesn't work in treatment. 
So what we do in treatment, sadly, for many kids, and Alaska uh, is a good example, every state actually is an example, every, our children get taken away and put into treatment somewhere else. Texas, many Alaska kids go to Texas and lots of places, and while they're there, they get good care, I think. Uh, they get a time out, you know, from their stressful time where they live that led them with lots of other factors to them being put, removed and put somewhere, so to speak, for treatment. And maybe they get some education on what the factors are that are affecting them, but in a certain amount of time, 30 days, 60 days, 180 days, even a year, they get helicoptered back out to their community, my community, Pawnee, Oklahoma. They're right back in the same situation. Their environment around them has not changed. So then they don't have the supports necessarily to keep them going forward. And they either go backwards or they're back, back backwards or they're back to where they were. And so it, it doesn't always work. One of the things we did with NREP, and I'll just tell you this real quick, is um, so for 20 years we've been trying to figure this out. We don't want the federal government to tell us what we should do. We're saying, I'm smarter than the average bear. We're smarter than, we know what, we're the experts. We're the experts for our children. We're the experts in our community. Uh, and our kids themselves are experts. They're experts in their life wherever they live. They can tell you things that we as adults don't, aren't, don't have the knowledge of. So uh, what we did with NREP, which is one of the most uh, largest um, repositories of evidence-based practices, science world, totally. We became friends with the science world. I was always popping in people's offices and like, hey, how you doing? And, uh, so we, uh, we decided that we need to find allies on the science world because, and then the long, to make a long story short, what we did is uh, we took evidence-based practices, EBP, the initials, and we flipped them around. And we did a marketing campaign on practice-based evidence because we figured that they are, they're so used to seeing EBP, we could kind of slip in PBE and we infiltrated their agendas, we went to all their meetings, we became buddies with them, we found allies within the practice-based evidence world. Some of them have said, <coughs> uh, and their whole work is built on the fact that you can't have evidence-based practice without practice-based evidence. Because what you design in an office setting may or may not work in Pawnee, Oklahoma. Probably won't, I can tell you that. Um, so that's kind of the long story how we did this. Uh, we spent 20 years working on it. We got NREP to develop a whole new segment of their registry on practice-based evidence, starting with tribal approaches, tribes as experts. We leveled the playing field of who is expert. Uh, tribal youth are the experts. Science guy over here might have the credentials and good guy, and I say guy because they're almost all men, but you know, um, somebody from my, one of the young people from my hometown has a lot more knowledge than Science Guy does and what will work and what won't work, and what's his influence and what's not. So anyway, they did this. They said, come on into SAMHSA and develop this, which we did. It's still on the website, but what happened is we had a presidential election. We have new people in SAMHSA and they closed NREP down uh, this year. It had nothing to do with our work. The higher-ups that did that, made those decisions, they didn't even know what we were doing. But the baby got thrown out with the bathwater, so all the work we did is still there, and we still have our own, um, we're, we have the information. We did a bunch of little videos, too. We did a lot of NATO TED Talks. Uh, so you can still go on the website and see it. Uh, and then SAMHSA recreated a different process, which I think might be on the next slide. Thanks, John. So that's what I was saying about who's expert. That's a big part of this whole comment, is making sure that the 
commissioner and the powers that be when they make their decisions recognize that the expert is not evidence based practice blindly evidence based practice the expert are you and the kids in your community um, and often we just need a clear way to express that uh, and one of the things that a couple of examples is we're just not community members and and you all are child welfare workers you're an expert in tribal help seeking patterns you're an expert in tribal youth engagement you're you know so we kind of have to sell ourselves in a different in a different way um, and we kind of have to practice on how we're promoting what we do as expert because it is we know it is but they don't know it is so we have to figure out how to say it in a way that catches their attention and that's what we're going to do this week so that's what i was saying about the cultural factor on evidence-based practice which isn't there pretty much there are hundreds and hundreds if not thousands of evidence-based interventions and practices pretty much they don't uh, some of them do but most of them don't have anything to do with culture um, and that's what i mean about the helicopter approach uh, most evidence-based practices are designed on tested out on different populations those populations don't include tribal people, almost never, because we're too small in number. Not because they're trying to diss us, we're just too small in, in number, so. Um, so you have to figure out which treatment might work best um, if you have to select an evidence-based practice. So the next one is, so who needs what? <coughs> That's the first important question. If I was you all in your communities, and you have this opportunity to receive funding, but part of that funding um, is man will par probably part of it will be mandated that it must be an evidence-based practice. So the first thing I would do is figure out who needs what in your community. Um, there's a really interesting source that I just ran across the other day, uh, and they talked about four protective factors that minority youth need to become healthy individuals. It's pretty simple, really, but if you think about it, it's very applicable to our communities, too. Uh, a positive home and school environment. So if your community doesn't have positive home and sc positive school environments, then there's probably an evidence-based practice you can look up, many, that can you might want to select from that might help address that. Uh, second one is stable parental mental health. Uh, and I heard some of that this morning on the panel of the uh, wonderful group of women that were talking about their own experiences and how I think one of them was saying that, you know, her, her parents, I mean, and probably her grandparents went to boarding school and, you know, she didn't really learn how to be a, uh, as, better, as good as a parent as she'd want to be. So uh, stable parental mental health is an important factor to help kids. And if, if there's people in your community, and even in my family maybe, that are not um, where they want to be in their emotional stability and their mental health, there are evidence-based interventions that can, that can help a lot with that. Another, the last two is high levels of social support and religious and community involvement. One of the things they found in healthy development of children and teenagers they want to be involved. They're smart. They want to be engaged. They want to be recognized. And sometimes we may have these pieces in our communities, but there's not really a place for young people, not a place for young people with leaders um, to take responsibility. In some places there are, but in, in other places there's not. Uh, positive racial and ethnic identity. If kids have feel really good about themselves, there's nothing stronger from my perspective in mental health than the cultural self. If you can't stand up to your full height and be really proud of who you are and proud of your tribal background or tribal, you're proud of your mixed race identity, because a lot of tribal kids have mixed race identity, then they kind of feel squashed down. My personal philosophy is that every native child is brilliant. They're born brilliant. It's the circumstances around them that kind of squash that down. So if you don't have that last factor of 
the kids don't feel positive about their background, then maybe it's bullying. And you on evidence-based practices can type in bullying, and maybe kids are they're being bullied, maybe by other kids in their um, community or on the school bus or non-tribal kids, whatever it might be. So th I think that's really good to look at those four, think just broadly think about those four factors. Here's some other common areas in tribal communities that I've seen and you know a lot and you all have too in lots of different ways. These are just these aren't all of them, but this is just a big kind of a big picture list. Trauma. Very hot topic now, um, for good reason. Long overdue. Uh, we talk a lot about historical trauma, but I'm more concerned about day to day traumas. Car wrecks, deaths, uh, suicides, uh, that impact on kids developing today and what to do with that grief and how to make sense out of the unsensible, it seems. That's harder, in my, just in my opinion. Uh, and that's not to diminish historical trauma. I mean, we all l lived it in our families, but day-to-day -day trauma is uh, pretty serious. And then um, how that affects decisions, decision-making, uh, conscious choices, and healthy life. Parenting skills is another one. Um, <coughs> and we heard that this morning, and that's some work that you all do, and that's a category of what you can receive funding for. Uh, parents, families need uh, information about child development. You know, if you're on your kids for something, but they're not even there, they don't even understand what you're talking about because they're not quite there in their development yet. It's really important, but the other thing is coaching and modeling. Some of the best helpful uh, therapy for parents uh, is the, and lots of places don't do this because they don't, they're not set up to do it, but the ones that do, it's really amazing. It's in-ear parent interactive therapy. So they have the kid, the child, and the parent in a one-way mirror room, and the little child or teenager does the same old things that they always do that pushes the button of the parent. Uh, but the therapist is on the other side of the wall and she whispers into the ear of the parent different ways to deal with that. So it's active, it's active uh, using technology, but in a way that's really much more helpful to a parent than just reading something about child development or having somebody talk about that and then, then they walk away and then your buttons get pushed and you forget it all. So, and then addiction. <coughs> the great thing about addiction, which is a, not a great thing, there's nothing great about addiction. But what they talked about this morning is the world's changing. It's no more looked at as a moral failing. There's, it's no more a shameful, um, kind of a feeling like a dead end road. The science has shown that it's actually much more complicated than that and it has to do with your brain chemistry and there's ways to treat that. Um, and then self-harm, I'm skip down, self-harm and suicide prevention, another big area that is a great concern in almost every tribal community. And the angst of young people on dealing with grief and loss and um, trauma and violence and kind of weighs more heavily on them than the, the good things that are always there too. So as they try to figure their way through that, they off some some young people take what I call a permanent solution to what is usually a temporary problem. So, but there's areas, the reason I bring these up, on these registries, you can just type in suicide prevention. Um, you can type in American Indian Alaska Native suicide prevention. You can, you can use these categories to kind of hone down some evidence-based practices that may or may not work for you, but it's a starting place. Uh, other supports is, these are kind of bigger, but boy, do we need tribal codes to mandate um, integrated teams. Because <coughs> right now, I used to work in juvenile. I never worked in child welfare directly. And I've worked in mental health for long, decades and decades. But it's very easy to get siloed. So the only person going out to homes is the child welfare worker. The only person that's doing this, when you have a whole 
array of tribal services. Uh, some of the tribes, I'm just amazed at the volume of services they have. But to really have integrated teams is usually only happens if it's mandated by the through tribal code and tribal law. Pasquale Yaki did that. I don't know if any of you all hear from there. Uh, and they required the head of child welfare and education and mental health and this whole big list that they're forced to meet at the same table once a month. Uh, anyway, <coughs> so, uh, and then the last thing I want to show you on this thing is this whole strength-based work, which is really important. And you can type in strength-based and evidence-based practices. You know how it used to go from what's wrong with you, the old school way? Then it went to what's happened to you, which is much more uh, supportive. The next evolution of that is what's right with you. What's your strengths? What do you want to do? Uh, what's really cool about your family? So, and then the last thing, trauma healing and support for the providers. The providers and the workers need as much support. If you're out there fighting the good fight every day, day after day, week after week, month after month, uh, it really regurgitates a lot of um, trauma that the providers have experience too so okay what's next so this is about the just a thing about the clearinghouse and registries and because that's a big source of this uh, legislation there's a lot of them there's been an information explosion there's over 250,000 clinical trials that have been recently it's just it's an, because we're in the age of data and age of computers people have just gone wild with uh, studies, most of which have nothing to do with tribal people directly. But so they have all these registries. They're all pretty new. They've only, they're only about 20 years old. So, you know, they're, they're pretty new. They're all over. And I think the next slide shows some of them, um, child welfare, uh, juvenile justice, uh, the um, National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Um, the NREP one that is now transformed into a different thing, but you can still find it on the website. There are a lot of registries. <coughs> um, and when you pull them up on the computer, there's usually a way you can just type in some words. To It'll give you a list of different evidence-based practices, and there are many. Like I said, NREP alone had 400 and something. So it's a lot. And, and I should say on NREP, there were actually three tribal programs listed as evidence-based practice meaning that they went through a lot of formal study and science evaluation to determine they're effective. One was American Indian Life Skills, uh, with Teresa LaFromboise work with SUNY. Um, one was Project Venture. Um, and the third one, I'm forgetting what it is. Uh, I can't remember what the third one was, but I don't think it was. Mm -mm. But nonetheless, uh, there are some tribal evidence-based practices. And if you look at that other link I gave you about the culture-driven work on that website, we also listed others, Canoe Journey. Um, I think we have four, um, four or five others, um, the Navajo uh, Veterans uh, Reimbursement. <coughs> so anyway, let me just keep going because we're going to run out of time here. So that's just a definition of culture-centered practices. And then the next one is cultural adaptation steps. Okay. So this is what I would do. If I was in any of your communities and you have this opportunity, evidence-based practices, and maybe you're not using any yet, or maybe not even that familiar with evidence-based practices, because who is is such a weird term, <coughs> I would develop a team first. You have to have a team, folks, so you're not in a silo and include um, your healthcare folks, your behavioral health folks, your young people, hopefully elders, but you know, a team of people, like a study group. And I would really consider using a facilitator because I've been in lots of tribal communities and one of the concerns that's usually there, so-and-so doesn't get along with so-and-so because of families, because of tribal elections, uh, child welfare doesn't talk to mental health, but a facilitator can help. You get these people in the room, it doesn't mean it's gonna be magic, you're gonna work. 
but sometimes an outside facilitator can help make that uh, work better. And then the question the group asks is, who needs what? In your particular community is, and the flip side of that, you know, what's the great assets that we have going? Uh, but, you know, the who needs what is, every community has different kinds of issues. Um, so you determine that, and then you look up the evidence-based practice registries and <coughs> type in whatever those words are. It could be parent, parenting skills. You can type in parenting skills and they'll pull up information about. And then the other thing a lot of people do is they find out what tribes are using similar things. Um, if there's something that you're interested in, you can go, you can find out through Casey, I'm sure, and other sources of what other tribes are using that particular evidence-based practice and how's it working for them. So a lot of tribes do that. Then after you select one, um, and my, in my opinion, evidence-based practices can be very good things. But if, if, it's, if you had a family that needed a lot of help, and all you did for them was to give them one evidence-based practice, and that's all they received. This is not gonna work. But an evidence-based practice out of one out of 10 things that you're doing for that family can really be a great help. So you have to kind of keep it in context of, of uh, the, all the other supports they're receiving. And the staff have to be trained in it. Whatever the evidence-based practice is, uh, has to be trained. Uh, there has to be a lot of training and oversight one of the uh, groups in Montana, um, they were doing wraparound, uh, a wraparound approach in schools. They, they had a manual, this is a tribal perspective. They had a supervisor that did nothing but stay in touch with the people in the schools to make sure they were kind of following the, the manual that they had, which worked for them very well. Uh, it, but there was a lot of supervision and support. Um, and a lot of times what happens is evidence-based practice, and you might have one or two people that kind of run off and do that, and it, it's not really um, integrated into your total approach. And then, let's see, let's go to the next one. So these are different ways, of co different types of cultural ad adaptation. And this is just about evidence-based practices adapting. My biggest thing, and you'll see it in what I put together for Casey this week, is tribal approaches are as effective as any evidence-based practice. So there's an equal expert in the room, not just evidence-based practice. But if you're going to culturally adapt an evidence-based practice, here's some different things. And can you go back one, please? That. So you pick an evidence-based practice. It's usually, um, it's often a, um, an approach or sometimes that it uses a, uh, an assessment tool, let's say that. So there might be, you know, 15 questions on an assessment tool and you want to use that. Well, maybe some of those questions don't work right. Maybe they don't fit your population, so you want to change the questions. That's one way, but you have to get permission to do that normally from whoever developed it. Sometimes the assessment works just fine, but it's how you ask the questions. It's the pace that you use to talk to whoever you're talking to. So you're not really changing the tool, you just change how you use it. In many tribal communities, that makes complete sense to do that. And sometimes you change the location. The tool's fine, the assessment tool's just fine. But where you're sitting with that, let's say, young person, and how, and the pace that you're talking to him or her, um, could be different. So you, you might be sitting in a car, you know, or you might be at the tribal cemetery, or you might be in an office, or you might be at the health clinic, or you might be in the school somewhere, but the location changes wherever they're more, most comfortable with. And then um, the other thing people do to adapt evidence-based practices, they add cultural examples. So they use the same, let's say, assessment tool, but they add examples to make it real for that person in their community, things that they're familiar with, instead of just this cold assessment tool. You know, they talk to them about it and they add, they deepen it a little bit, cultural examples. And then I think this is the last slide, but so some people have really 
some tribal folks in the country have really done a lot of great work on cultural adaptation of evidence-based practices, and Dee Bigfoot in Oklahoma is one of them. <coughs> my relative Dee, different tribe, but you know how this goes. My sister was married to her husband's cousin, so Dee and I are like that. <laughs> So we're relatives in a different way. But she, her work in Oklahoma City, you guys probably are familiar with it, have done a lot of great things. And But two examples that they've done out of many is they did, um, they have this training program. Um, people get a teams of people from tribes come. They get received training with Dee and her staff on cultural adaptation of trauma-focused cognitive behavior treatment. Um, and you can look it up on the website and find her information. You can just put her name in, it'll probably pop up. But um, So she takes some basic therapy approaches and indemnizes them. And they've done it for a long time and it's really effective. So they've done it in several things. They've also done it with parent-child interaction therapy um, but there's people like her that are uh, very smart tribal people, usually connected to a university, which she is, uh, which is another huge resource for you all. Any university in your state or tribe, uh, Dolores Bigfoot. Um, but that's an example of someone who's really done the full-fledged cultural adaptation. And I think that's the last it. So. That's my contact information. I think these slides will be accessible to you all through your network. But Any questions for Holly? I'll just ask one question, and that is, wh is there were there procedures developed, like through NREP or whatever, for these things to get recognized as um, allowable programs? I know, for instance, the state of Oregon you may be familiar with, had a process where their culturally based, um, maybe their evidence-based program, the tribes had a way of getting their culturally based programs approved as part of that. So is there like a process that they had developed? Yes, uh, there has to be a criteria. Um, how do you know what you're doing is working? And um, so there is criteria that was developed and the Oregon um, work is one of the ones that's on, we put on the NREP website. So. I don't know if that answers it totally, but. Okay, so. I was looking at the child welfare registry this morning, and they have, a, they do have a quite a few practices on there. They're not tribal specific, but the, the, the uh, they're not calling it a registry, but the Casey, um, what do they call that, um, Jack? Uh, what, the, what Casey is doing is probably um, your most relevant resource, I think. Um, and there's other tribal developed work, like everyone's familiar with positive, positive Indian parenting. Uh, but the challenge with that is doesn't meet the scientific uh, proof, which is kind of ridiculous. But uh, And so that's part of what the Casey response to the legislation is going to be, is to try to get um, efforts like positive end in parenting approved on the on the list. So the question is about you know is anybody scanned the universities that are most um, have done tribal work? And you know the the I think uh, one guy uh, did that. One Sky uh, is based out of Portland, Oregon, and um, it doesn't exist in full form now, but I think you can still find information if you look on, just type in One Sky and it'll pull it up. The other connection is all of the tribal circles of care and tribal systems of care, which is a SAMHSA funded effort. And there are several hundred tribes there. They all were required and received money to develop evaluation efforts, and most of them worked with universities. Uh, so there's a kind of a resource there as well. Um, so those are two that I can think of. But that's a really good idea. Um, and we there's a meeting in two weeks with the Tribal Systems of Care uh, and the SAMHSA folks. So I will um, see if something exists like that, which I think it does, and I'll make sure it gets 
to Casey. Turn it over to Andrea. Uh, well, it's like, keep asking questions because I'm thinking of the comments that we're gonna provide <laughs> for the thing due on the 22nd. So my name is Andrea Smith. I'm attorney for Children and Family Services for the Port Campbell Sklalom Tribe. We're teeny tiny, uh, less than 1,300 members. About a third of them are under the age of 18. So all of this is really important for us. Um, I'm gonna talk about a little bit about what we've been doing on the ground. So we looked and looked and looked and looked because this always happens, right, for parenting skills courses. And we ended up trying to, we're, we're using positive Indian parenting right now. But we went through a giant process, giant, I'm not kidding, months and months of really long meetings um, involving tribal elders and mental health folks and other facilitators and people from child welfare. And we had a facilitator come in and help us with it too. And we completely redid the manual that positive Indian parenting gives you because a lot of it didn't apply to our particular sklalom culture. So we're looking forward to partnering with people to see how we can argue a little bit more about some of this evidence-based practice stuff. I mean, cause there's a lot of language, right? So sorry, right, attorney. <laughs> so I look at this and I spoke with a researcher who's over at University of Washington. Um, and she said that we might want to look at at least talking about what an appropriate comparison practice is. Because standard statistical evidence is not going to work for some place like us. We've had to go through a whole different process to be able to do evaluations. Um, and Port Campbell, for sure, we do this all the time, is we pick out every single word in there and then we ask them what the feds actually think they meant. <laughs> That's fine what you wrote down in there, but is that what you actually meant when you're talking about the fact that we all know, we know what's best for our kids. And so the practices we're doing in child welfare anyway, whether they're gonna be fundable or not, are the ones that work, right? So, and you all heard, right? You all heard Ross Hunter up there uh, with me saying that the state of Washington is gonna help us, <laughs> right? You all heard that, right? Right, right, okay, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna hold them to that because I want all everybody's other states to be like that too, whatever that's gonna mean. Because performance-based measures don't always work for us either, too small, right? And it just makes more work for your, for your child welfare workers. So we have two social workers. I mean, we have two child welfare workers. We have one investigator who's also the program manager. We have, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then we have a bunch of us, like I said before, who are admin staff, so child welfare is mine, but so is TANF, child support, elders, youth, and mental health, and CD is all mine too. So, but that's true of a lot of places, right? I mean, we all wear 500 different hats and you do what you have to do. So I think we can make a lot of really good arguments. I'm just strategizing what they are about making sure, like you were saying, I really like hearing that, practice-based evidence. Um, I think we have a really good opportunity to be able to look at some of that. And I was gonna keep this really short so that people could ask questions. So, so See, I'll even walk to you. That's why I gotta be able to carry this around. I'm like that. See what I highlighted here? So in this, it, there's two places, appropriate comparison practice and then using conventional, right, standards of statistical significance, which like I said, that part is not gonna work for us because if you have five cases in a year and one of them blows out, that's 20% of our caseload, that doesn't tell you anything, right? I mean, it doesn't tell you anything. Yeah. <laughs> With the highlighting, right? I know, I know. It's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. But I think that part is going to be, it could be important. But that's another really good argument. <coughs> uh, and it's not an argument, it's a fact. Mm -hmm. The fact is that if 
states and the countries concerned about the number, the disproportionality of native children in, in child welfare, which we saw all the data this morning. And they are, this legislation is supposed to help fix that. But if the statistical analysis requirements don't match that, it's not going to work. So they need to broaden, the, open that other window and broaden the practice-based evidence and the cultural piece. Because that statistical piece is attached to every, it, all three of those levels. So <coughs> they, um, a little education, and I think that's what's going to happen, or has already happened today, and it's going to happen again, and then with the comments as well, so. Exactly. <laughs> But hopefully they would like to, as we all know, we do this all the time, hopefully the feds would uh, like us to educate them on some of this. <laughs> yeah, um, because they know, at least they're asking for it. I know this is a really short turnaround because they're coming up on all their big old deadlines, but we can always add things to their list later on. They just happen to have to have something out by October 1st, so. <laughs> and I think we probably ask, ask them as many times as they can so we're all sitting in the room and all heard the same thing, <laughs> right? Yeah, my question is, so um, typically we take Western therapies and then we add our native culture to it. So I don't wanna do that anymore. So I'm wondering if we can have our cultural ways and then add Western therapies as adjuncts. Like, oh, okay, here's motivational interviewing. See, it's evidence-based. Here's CBT, here's DBT, y you know, and is, is that legitimate? Would that make the program? <laughs> they just want us to make sure we use this. That's so, culture's not an add-on. Culture's the core and the, the treatment is the add-on. So yeah, but it is legitimate. Any other comments, questions? Um, you know, I do think, I mean, I've the only one that I've actually seen, you know, procedural one is the Oregon one. And that one, I think, kind of does that, right? It kind of starts by asking, what's the cultural history behind this? What's the cultural basis for this? What, you know, kind of, wh how do you know that this works within your culture? I mean, that's a lot of what that, that particular um, uh, uh, document is about. And I don't pretend to be an expert on all the things out there. That's why... We brought in Holly, and, and I will tell you, just so you know, I mean, we, this is like just the last week that we've managed to, to um, get Holly to, to agree to do this. So she's been putting this together, you know, on very short notice, and she's going to put together more materials for you on very short notice. But as she said, you know, when we talked with her, I'm extremely busy, but this is so important, I have to do this. And so I think that, that hopefully we can get you um, enough information that you'll be able to, you know, not only make that comment, but hopefully have enough information to say, well, this isn't just, you know, this is a comment, but there are ways to do this. People have already thought about this, but you don't have to invent the wheel f from, you know, uh, you don't have to invent the wheel and, and sort of link what you're saying, hopefully with some information where you can sort of, you know, make your case as to how this legislation, in order to be effective, needs to do something, something similar. One of the, the shifts for us in our thinking, we have to be really clear on what it is we're trying to measure. You know, because we're used to being do-gooders. You know, we're just out there every day helping people, and but we're not really paying attention to what specifically we're trying to change, what behaviors, what outcomes, what, so that's the thing about Oregon and uh, the Navajo veterans uh, and um, the other groups that have done that, they had to get very clear on what it is they're trying to change. What, how do you know it's effective? So it's not that, wasn't that, it's not really that hard to do, it just, we're just so used to being general do-gooders that it forces us to kind of think much more precisely about what it is we're trying to do and what we're changing. And there's a lot more to it than that, but, but I'm hoping to, what I've committed to doing, 
before Friday. And I have company coming on Friday, 2 o'clock. I have to be at the airport to pick them up Friday afternoon. So I have to be done before Friday. <coughs> yeah, probably like 10 o'clock, <laughs> pushing send. Uh, what I hope to do is just um, a summary of bullet points with this is what needs to be addressed. This is the reason why, because it all has to have some some uh, reference, some scientific reference on why it's important, and then uh, what just bulleted points about what the arguments are from my perspective, and then it goes to Casey, and uh, hopefully Casey will send out something like that to, uh, to everyone else for your comments. But we're all there in our thinking. Your normal gut reaction is telling you, wait a minute. So I'm taking the wait a minute feeling and putting it into bullet points by, let's say, let's say 11 o'clock Friday. <laughs> and then it's the mad dash to the airport. <laughs> yeah, I'll do my best. Right. <laughs> and, and you'll be driving out there and we'll be talking on the phone, right? Any other um, questions, comments, concerns? I don't even know what time we're supposed to end. Do you, are, are we done? Seven minutes ago. Did they extend these sessions? Do you, does anybody know? You don't think so? OK, so I guess we should just end it here. And uh, thank you for thank you for doing this.